Good morning to everybody and a very warm welcome to morning worship from Great Clacton Parish today. It's great to have you with us. My name is Mark. I'm the vicar here. You're very welcome to get in touch with me. I'll leave up the contact email and uh, phone number for, for texting up here. Do get in touch with me at any stage and do share some greetings if you want with others at this time. And it's not too late to get in touch and ask for an invitation to Zoom tea and coffee, which we're having after the service. We meet on Zoom, we provide our own tea and coffee, unfortunately. And we've got a great number of things planned for this morning. We have got a second world focus and we're going to have some news from Mark and Ruth in Battelle in Birmingham. We look forward to that. We've got a great children's spot from uh, Rachel this morning, which is going to help us to think about the last in our series from the book of 2 Timothy. And one thing that 2 Timothy reminds us is the power of God's word, the power of God's message. God's word was powerful enough, the Bible tells us, to create, create the whole universe. And it's powerful enough, the gospel message, to bring light into the darkest of places. The dark of, darkest of places in our lives, in our communities, in our world. And so we sing as we start, Thy whose almighty word um, thank you very much indeed for leading us in this just now. Well, that brings us to our confession prayer this morning. We like to take a moment each week to pause and to say sorry to God for the things that we've done wrong. And we learned a new confession prayer last week and we're going to use it again today. That was because the Bible we learned in last week's reading is there to rebuke us, that's tell us off when we're doing wrong things, to, to correct us when we've got something wrong in our lives, as well as to teach us and to train us for, for God's work. And this is the confession prayer where we need to, to grab a Bible and hold on to it. And maybe think of some ways that the Bible is telling us off, 
some things we need to say sorry to God for. And then we let the Bible teach us, teach us that God loves to forgive because he sent Jesus as our saviour. So are we holding a Bible? And are we ready to think about things that might be correcting us and rebuking us about? So the words of the confession today are going to come up on the screen. Maybe you would say them with me. But just pause for a moment and maybe think how the teaching of the Bible has corrected us or rebuked us. And what we might need to say sorry to God for. So we pray together. Father God, thank you that your word, the Bible, is there to rebuke and correct us, as well as to teach and train us. We are sorry when we have not listened to the scriptures and we have not obeyed them. Please forgive us. And please help us to trust in the salvation in Jesus that the Bible tells us about and strengthen us to live that holy life which your word can train us to live. Amen. So that verse that we read last week from 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 tells us that God's word, scripture, is able to teach us, to rebuke us, to correct us, and to train us. And one thing it does teach us in the book of 2 Timothy as well, is that Jesus came into the world to be our saviour, to save us from our sins, to bring us life, so we can live for him. And because of that, we can pray this prayer. May God, who loved the world so much, that he sent his son to be our saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we're going to sing a song now that reminds us that the Bible promises forgiveness and calls us to, to trust in that promise along with all the other promises the Bible makes. It's the song from the breaking of the dawn to the setting of the sun, I will stand on every promise of your word. And we're going to sing uh, these words in the second verse. When I stumble and I sin, condemnation pressing in, I will stand on every promise of your word. You are faithful to forgive, that in freedom I might live. So I stand on every promise of your word. Thanks to Pam once again for leading us in this one.
Well, we're just about to have our children's spot in a moment or two. But before that, you might like to see some pictures from last week's uh, children's spot. And it was a children's spot that didn't just get the children involved, but got the adults involved too. You might remember that T set us the challenge of making some armour or gathering some armour that represents and reminded us of the full armour of God. And in the full armour of God, God's word, uh, the Bible, is called the, the sword of the spirit. And so uh, I think some people had their Bibles in their hands, some people had swords to represent that in their hands. And uh, well done to uh, the children who joined in. Here's some pictures. And I know that one or two adults did as well, though only one was uh, brave enough to send that picture in. Thank you so much uh, to all of them for taking part. Now, I hope you've got your thinking caps on because Rachel's going to introduce this week's Bible reading with the children's spot just now. Morning, everyone. Thanks for having me along to your service this morning. Um, so I've got a little bit of an activity for you to have a go at today. I've got some different news headlines uh, that might pop up. They're all made up, so they're not really true. Uh, but what I want you to just think about is, are they good news or bad news? And we can all do that as we go along. So if you think it's good news, then put your thumbs up. If you think it's bad news, you can put your thumbs down. So let's have a look at that first news headline. Sprout harvest has failed, so there'll be no Brussels sprouts at Christmas this year. Good news or bad news? Well done. Okay, next one. Tottenham Hotspur win the Premier League. Is that good news or bad news, do you think? Okay, let's see our next headline. Government reveals plans for a new school day running from 7am to lunchtime. Okay, next one. Big snowfall forecast for this weekend across the UK. Do you think that's good news or bad news? Extra maths lessons compulsory for all children. Is that good news or bad news? Let's see the next headline. Prime Minister says all non-essential shops will remain closed until January. Let's see the next one. New study says that all children should be allowed to stay up as late as they like. Good news or bad news? Okay, and one final headline. Marmite company goes bust. No more Marmite. Is that good news or bad news? Okay, I hope you had a bit of fun with that. Well, as Paul comes to the end of his letter, which we're looking at today in the service, he's got some news for Timothy. Um, and like the news headlines we've just seen, 
it's a bit sort of debatable about whether it's good news or bad news. Let's have a look at Paul's news. He says, my life is being given as an offering to God. The time has come for me to leave this life. We've already learned from Paul's letter to Timothy that Paul is in prison and now Paul tells Timothy that he's going to die. Do you think Timothy would have thought that was good news or bad news? Well, Paul was Timothy's friend and his mentor, so this would have been really sad news for Timothy. But to Paul, it's actually not sad news. It's not bad news at all. Let's have a listen to what Paul says. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul gives Timothy two reasons why he's actually quite happy to die. It's good news for him. First of all, Paul knows the task that God gave him is nearly finished. He's served God well and he's done his job. He gives us a little picture of this by saying, I finished the race. If you can think back to your last sports day, probably not last year, uh, probably not in 2020, but probably the year before, a long time ago now, then you'll remember the satisfying feeling of finishing a race. And that's how Paul tells us that he's feeling as he's coming to the end of his life. And secondly, Paul tells us that he is looking forward to a wonderful prize that God will give to him when he dies and goes to be with Jesus forever, the crown of righteousness. And best of all, Paul tells us this prize isn't just for him, but for all who keep going, following Jesus and long to see him again. Let that be us too. Well, not just as Rachel recorded us a children's spot, she's recorded us a children's song to go with it. Now, this is just a little bit catchy, uh, a little bit lively. You can make up some actions to go with it if you want to. And right in the middle of it is that idea of life as a race that we can run and a race that we can run for the Lord Jesus. Back over to Rachel.
Well, thank you so much to Rachel for her children's spot and the children's song. And we just take that picture of life as a race that we run for Jesus and we want to get to the end. The, the idea of a, a heavenly prize. Today, athletes get a medal. So Rachel has decided that the children's spot today should be to make a medal, to remind ourselves of the race that we're running for Jesus. You could draw one or, or, or I guess make one out of plasticine or anything you like, but we would love to see some pictures of the medals you make. You're going off to do that in just a second, but maybe before that you'd help us with the birthdays this week because there are a lot of them uh, to sing about. It's a great week uh, for birthdays. It's Catherine's birthday in Uganda this week. It's also June's birthday, Phil's birthday, Monica's birthday, Daniel's birthday, and Joy's birthday. And anybody else who has a birthday, but we don't know about it, happy birthday to you as well. So for Catherine, Joan, Phil, Monica, Daniel and Joy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Catherine, Joan, Phil, Monica, Daniel and Joy. Happy birthday to you. I don't think we forgot anybody, so round of applause. Well, the children could go off and do their challenge just now. See how they got on with that. Do send me some photos. And adults, maybe you can just hang on a minute or two. We've got some news coming up from Mark and Ruth at Battelle in just a second. Just some notices before that, however. Do remember that the church is still open for private prayer, even when we can't open for public worship. We're open at St John's Sunday morning from nine to 10, and then through the week from half nine to half 10, Monday, Tuesday at St John's, Wednesday at St Mark's, Thursday and Friday back at St John's, half nine to half 10 each day. Do come and sit for a while if it helps you to pray. While we can't uh, meet as a church family in our buildings, we have got all those wonderful things on YouTube. We have got the last Ask a Pastor before the Christmas break coming up this week and the last Thursday Thought. And that's because during December, we're gonna be doing something just a little bit different. And also we've kind of changed how we do our family time on Sunday afternoon, just a bit shorter, a bit simpler. We're now just reading a, a wonderful story from a storybook about a Bible story. Why don't you have a look and see um, if you like it? We would love to know. And today I'm gonna to be reading the story and then next week Hannah's going to be reading one. That's the family time, four o'clock on YouTube, on our YouTube channel and then available anytime after that. And then at six o'clock it's our evening prayers this evening and tonight T and the family are leading our evening prayers so that should be absolutely great. Our next week is Advent Sunday and do join us at 11 o'clock for our online uh, morning worship then and there we'll be revealing all that's going on in our programme running up to, to Christmas. There's going to be a lot going on there so uh, do have a look in next week and find out all about it. And one thing we're going to be doing is our children's and families and adults if they want to Christmas trail. That involves putting some pictures of parts of the Christmas story up in windows and allowing uh, people to go and find them. And so if you've got a house that's around St John's or one that's near St Mark's or one that's near Can Hall or Legerton Drive do, and you'd be prepared to host a, a picture, do let us know. We would love to put one up there. Or if you don't have a house in that area but you'd be willing to decorate a picture. We've got the outlines, you just need to add a bit of colour to them. 
we would love to hear from you as well. Do get in touch with me or get in touch with the church office. And one other thing that we're going to be having during December, not giving too much away, is we're going to have every day an online Advent uh, calendar, a virtual Advent calendar. We're preparing that over the next couple of days. Do pray for us as we do that. And we hope that it will be something that both is fun, but also that we can learn the true Christmas story from our uh, virtual Advent calendar. There's more about all those things in our newsletter, uh, new newsletter out this week. Do have a look there and inside you'll find an invitation to uh, send a greeting on our church Christmas card or a greeting on our video Christmas card this year. Have a look in the newsletter, find out how to do that. We want to keep in touch with one another as much as we can this Christmas. Well, as I mentioned last week, we're due to have some news from Mark and Ruth at Battelle, and they've made us a wonderful video to tell us how they're getting on. And this was made just a couple of weeks ago, just before this uh, present lockdown started. And so they haven't quite been able to, to do all the things that they say they wanted to in the video, but they're still planning to do them. Over to Mark and Ruth for what's always a really encouraging time to hear from them. Good morning to everyone in Clacton at St John's and St Mark's. It's nice to join you from Birmingham here and kind of keep our faces in front of you just so you can see us and don't forget who we are. We wanted just to really give you a little update from the Cuthbert family and from Battelle just to just so that you can be aware of how we're doing here and ways in which you can pray for us. Yeah, so um, personally, um, part of, kind of from our family point of view, um, we're doing well on the whole. Harvey's just turned four, so we have a four-year-old in the household. It's about four going on nine. He managed to have um, three mini parties and lots of cake, which he absolutely loved. Um, he's enjoying being back at preschool, thriving really, loving being with friends. Um, the only thing he's really struggling with is not being able to visit friends and family in their actual houses. Um, and trying to get his four-year-old head around that is quite difficult. Um, Sophia is, she's a little joy, she's on the go all the time, uh, climbing everything that she can find um, and she's quite a feisty little character as well so we've got to, yeah we've got our hands full um, and have to have eyes on the back of our heads but she's doing really well and she loves being around other kids as well um, which is a real blessing. Um, in our last newsletter I mentioned that I've been struggling a bit health wise um, so I'm still struggling. Um, I have noticed quite a change, quite an improvement since sending that newsletter out. So I'm really believing that that's through prayer, um, which is amazing. So please keep praying for that. I just got some blood tests back um, and they were all normal. So need to go back to the doctor really and see what other avenues we can look into. Um, but other than that, doing well. Mark's, I think, doing well, um, keeping, holding our family together. Um, yeah, so as a family, we're doing well, we're busy, um, but it's, yeah, it's going well, isn't it? Yeah, much of my time recently has been uh, spent down at the new headquarters building, which you've been uh, following along with us for the last couple of years, the, the journey from an empty shell of a warehouse into a, a functioning church. And just this weekend, we should hopefully have finished one new suite of rooms. So the very first phase of the building, which will enable us to actually get in and use it, should actually occur this Sunday. So I've taken just a little short video of the building, which I'd like to show to you now, so that you can uh, just picture some of it, rather than rather than just always hearing about us talk about it. We'd like to just show you just a little little tour of what we've done so far, so you can see the progress. So as you as you look at this now, we're kind of walking in through one of the main entrances into into the main corridor where the first meeting rooms are now being completed. So this is the first main meeting room that we will be hopefully using for some small socially distant church meetings in the next few days. So you can see it's it's beautifully finished, room for probably around about 100 to 120 people and eventually we'll be able to be divided up into three separate rooms that we can hopefully hire out to people. We want this to be a resource for the local church uh, so we've, we've made these rooms 
um, available to anyone that can hire them in the local church or other, other churches. We move down another corridor and just opposite that large meeting room is this secondary room which we've been using for a youth room temporarily which has its own entrance onto the street and its own TV and is shortly going to be filled with furniture. They've also installed for us, well, this is actually finished now, it's not in this picture, but there's a lovely little kitchenette area in there. Toilets on the right hand side and the bathroom in front. And this is our favourite room so far, this is the library space where there are um, shelving, uh, tent, gas fire, and hopefully it will be filled with books and be a lovely study area for us to use soon. And it's all, it's all coming on really nicely. As you can see, it's really starting to take shape. And this is only the very first phase of the building. This is probably about 5 to 10% of the entire floor uh, space of the building that you see there. So, I mean, it's a, it's a big project, which is going to continue for like another, at least another year or so. So we're, we're believing by faith that God is going to continue to provide all of the money for, for the project to be finished. So far, we've done everything in the building. We've never had any money in our bank account particularly to to see the work take place is that for what god has provided on a on, almost on a daily basis so thank you for standing with us in prayer on this and we hope to show you more videos and photos over the next few months as more and more of the building gets complete so um from a patel point of view as well we've um nationally we've really been quite unhit um by COVID cases um, we've had a few, but none have been very serious. Um, we've not had anyone hospitalised nationally, which is amazing. So God's hand of protection has really been over us, um, which is a miracle, really, when you consider the community aspect um, of what we do. We're still taking in new people, new residents. Um, this is slow because of the process of having to quarantine them when they <coughs> arrive. Um, and especially now it's going to be a little bit more tricky with the different tier set up across the country but we are really trying to find ways of safely doing it um, and we do make sure we quarantine people um, but please pray that people stay the quarantine time isn't easy for them um, yeah that kind of segregation is quite difficult um, but pray that people see the longer term kind of impact that staying can have and listen to the testimonies around them um we like mark said this weekend we're going to be hopefully using um anchor point as kind of a place to meet together so we are still managing to meet together um within the restrictions um yeah which is a real blessing and is central to what we do so we really want to keep finding ways to do that and um, to encourage each other spiritually to be able to pray together um yeah and encourage growth in the people around us um and we want to thank you so much for the toiletries that um you've sent over uh, mark and caroline dropped over i think three four boxes yesterday mm -hmm. those are such a blessing such a practical blessing um for our men and women so thank you we'll be distributing those today we've sorted them all um and the houses will be absolutely thrilled <laughs> So hopefully that gives you a little glimpse into into our world over the last few weeks. And we'd like to leave you with a, a testimony of one of one of the guys in Patel, one of our really good friends, and is actually Harvey's godfather. And if that kind of whets your appetite for some more kind of testimonies of God's goodness in, in lives of people in Patel, then you'll be able to purchase this lovely book which has just been released. It's called Escaping Addiction: Portraits of Hope and Restoration, and it's rammed full of before and after pictures of people that are in Battelle or have been through the doors of Battelle and just a little bit of their story and how God has worked in their lives. I mean, it's available to, to purchase from our website or if you don't want to buy it, you could see my mother and borrow hers. <laughs> so we want to leave you just with this uh, testimony from Timon and we hope it encourages you and just kind of whets your appetite for the ministry of Battelle and for what God does in our midst here. So we leave this with you and say thank you so much for your kind of continuing support and your prayers for, for so many years and just Thank you for keeping us in your minds and your hearts. Bye See you. Bye-bye. Hi, my name's Tymon. I came to Patel ten and a half years ago. Uh, it's hard to believe that that was me. I'd been a heroin addict for 20 years, injecting, taking crack cocaine. For 27 years of my life, I took drugs. I just couldn't escape them. 
at the end of 27 years, you can imagine it completely destroyed my life, destroyed the life of my family, all my friends, people that loved me. I had absolutely nothing left at all. I was desperate. I found my, de my friend dead in my flat and I had to get out of town quickly. The only place I could go was Batal. So I came to Batal and, and, I, and I met Jesus there in a way that was real and I surrendered my life to the Lord. Uh, I, I dabbled in churches and Christianity before trying to break free, but it was only when I came to Batal that I really found the meaning of true surrender to the Lord and, and to live out a life that, that is for the gospel, truly. And since I've been in Batal, um, I, I was asked to become a leader and then I became a business leader, ran a gardening business, and then I qualified as a tree surgeon. And now I, uh, I preach and I do Bible classes, teaching, and I go around the country preaching and teaching. And my, my wife, Lynn, and I, uh, we, we run the center in Coventry. It's just amazing what God has done in my life. You know, it's completely, totally transformed me. There's, there's no way you can ever look at look at that picture and think that this is the person now. It's just a, a, an amazing transformation. So I'll just give God all the glory for that. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Mark and Ruth, for that really encouraging uh, roundup of all that's going on in your lives at the moment. And another reminder how, through the work of Patel, God's uh, word can change people's lives. The good news about Jesus changes people's lives, even in the hardest of circumstances. And that's an encouragement to us as we've been learning from the book of 2 Timothy. We uh, chose this book to look at at this time because it encourages us as a church, it encourages me as a church leader to make sure that we focus on what's essential for us as a church. Paul, an older Christian, a Christian leader for the early church coming to the end of his life, telling Timothy, his uh, younger helper, what to focus on in his church what to focus on as he teaches and leads people. And so we've come up with a list of things that we've learned so far from the book of 2 Timothy, of how we want to be as a church. We've learned that we should be a church that's centered on Jesus, a church that's filled with faith, a church that's relying on the Holy Spirit and his power, a church that's treasuring the gospel of God's grace, a church that's planning to teach, teach, teach it, to pass it on to new generations. A church that's ready for endurance because it's not going to be an easy task. A church that's sticking to the truth, even when others are trying to, to draw the church away from the truth. A church that's treating all with kindness, even those who disagree with us. And a church that's equipped with the scriptures we learned last week. We learned what the scripture is able to do in lives. So we're equipped with the scriptures and also following the example of true teachers. When so many around would uh, end up as false teachers leading the, 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 the church away. And those were 10 things, 10 essentials that we want to hold on to as a church. If you want to think about them a bit more, we used them in last week's evening prayers to focus our prayers on those 10 things. But we've got two more to add to the list today as we bring the book to a close. Well, first of all, we're gonna to pray to God. We're gonna to pray to God using the song that Rachel told us last week, that as we hear God's word, it would have an effect on our lives. And then after Rachel leads us in that, it's over to Gary to read today's reading, 2 Timothy chapter 4, for us just now.
Today's reading is from 2 Timothy, chapter 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage, with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titimus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him, because he is strongly opposed to our message. At my first defence, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus, Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus ill in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think lots of people have a fascination with famous people's final words, last words. A quick internet search shows loads of lists compiled of the famous things that famous people have finally said. Winston Churchill apparently said, I'm bored with it all. Queen Elizabeth I, all my possessions for a moment of time. Bob Marley, who died young at 36 said, money can't buy life, said it to his son. Frank Sinatra apparently said, I'm losing it. Groucho Marx quipped, this is no way to live. And American Civil War General John Sedgwick apparently said, they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. Well, they were from the internet. Hopefully some of them are true. And here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we've got what probably are St Paul's last words, at least his last written words. Just a reminder of what we think happened to Paul at the end of his life. 
The book of Acts tell us how he was under house arrest and waiting trial. But it seems that he was released after that house arrest, did some more ministry before he was re-arrested and faced a a harsher prison uh, regime, which is where he writes to Timothy from. And Rachel pointed us to the words in chapter 4, verses 6 to 8, where he says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. He thinks the end is near, and looking back on this last bit of time, he says in verse 16, At my first defence, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood by my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul seems to think that he's completed the race because he's had that chance to do what God gave him to do to spread the message throughout the the Gentile world, and especially in Rome, the centre of the the empire. And he's had that chance to preach even at his own trial. He spread that message, and he thinks he's completed the, the task that God gave him. So he thinks the end is approaching. At his first trial, he said he, he, he was acquitted. He, he escaped. He was rescued by God. And he looks forward to being rescued by God again. Though this time, not from death, but through death. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom, he says. And yet the timing of all this is a bit uncertain. It's clear from these last verses that he hopes that Timothy will be able to come and see him, probably for the last time. And he hopes Timothy will be able to bring Mark with him, and a cloak as well, which is a lovely little personal touch, isn't it? And so he tells Timothy, verse 9, to come quickly. He tells him, verse 21, to come before winter. In other words, before sailing across the Mediterranean becomes impossible because of the winter storms. And so he seems to want to gather around him his trusted team members, those he's done ministry with before, those who've been faithful to him. And I guess he wants to share with them one last time what he's written in this letter of 2 Timothy. We've got here the sort of message that he wanted to pass on to them. He wanted to pass on to them those essentials. And that's why it's a great book for us to look at at a church, at an uncertain time, as in our world it is at the moment, but to hold on to what's essential for us as a church. And so it's like he takes a deep breath and he gives the last couple of essentials. First of all, he says, be committed to preaching the word. Verses one to five, be committed to preaching the word. The word, well, He probably means by that just the gospel message in the Bible. He's called it the good deposit before. He's called it the truth. He's called it the testimony about our Lord. He's told Timothy how it's contained in the Old Testament scriptures and in the teaching of Jesus that's been passed on and explained by Paul. And the theme through the letter is that Timothy himself must continue in it. He must treasure it. He must pass it on to others. He must teach it. And so drawing this all together, Paul gives the solemn charge in verses 1 and 2. He says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Timothy's to preach it. 
He's to proclaim it. It's the word that's used of a herald. The one who comes into the marketplace with a a message from the king. The trumpet sounds and he declares the message of good news. The message that the war is over or something like that. It's the sort of message that a town crier would draw attention to by by ringing his bell. He's He's to preach this message, to proclaim it. You see, he's not just to believe it himself. He's not just to guard it and treasure it. He's not just to know how valuable it is, but he's to preach it, proclaim it. This sentence draws together so much of what's in the letter as a whole. And part of this will be correcting and rebuking and encouraging. He says in verse uh, uh, 2, with great patience and careful instruction. And both those sides, both kind of correcting, rebuking and encouraging, are important as we preach. We should be doing both. And that's the link with God's scripture, because those similar words came up when he talked about the scripture. The scripture has got all that it needs in it to do this preaching effectively, to, to, to correct, to rebuke and to teach. And maybe the focus of it here is that he's to be prepared in season and out of season to do this. Be prepared in season and out of season. Now, some of us are fair weather gardeners, aren't we? We like to be out there in the summer, but this time of year when it's a bit cold, not so keen. Some of us are fair weather walkers. We love to be out in the countryside, but when the sun is shining and the ground is dry, not so good at when it's muddy and uh, a bit a bit wet and misly like it is at the moment. Some of us are even first weather swimmers. We love to be down on the beach when we're enjoying the sunshine and the water's warm. But of course there are all year round gardeners, those who are out week by week, whatever the weather. All year round walkers who'll walk in the rain, the mud, the snow, whatever. There are even all year round swimmers Aren't there? Those who from Clacton or Walton or Frinton beaches are are down there swimming in the sea every day. Well done to them. You see, Timothy's not to be a fair weather preacher. He's to preach in season and out of season. That means he's to preach even when his congregation don't want to hear it, when they're out of season. He's to proclaim the message even when the community around don't really like what he says when they're out of season. He's to proclaim the message even when he is feeling out of season, when he's not feeling up to it, when he's not feeling in tune with it as he should be. He's still to get on and do it because deep down he knows it's true. And these out of season times will come and there will be difficult times when it's hard to preach. Paul reminds him of what he's already said back in chapter 3 that he helped us to understand last week. He says in verses 3 and 4, You're to keep preaching for the time will come when people do not want to put up a sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather round them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. It's going to be difficult. Paul says to Timothy, but, but, verse 5, you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Keep your head. In other words, literally stay sober. Stay sober and just get on with it, Paul says. Keep running that race. Keep preaching the word. And over the years, the church has been through terrible times. Terrible times brought on it by itself. Terrible times brought on it by the situation around. But it survived. And it will survive, Paul says. He's seen it all before. And so he tells Timothy to keep his head and just get on with his work, preaching the word. And we must too... Keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, 
discharge all the duties of your ministry. We must do it too. We want to be a church that's committed to preaching the word. But that's not quite where Paul finishes, is it? You see, he goes on to tell us about his own situation. But he does it in a way, especially in relation to lots of people. He tells it in relation to the people who've let him down, like Demas. To those who've opposed him, like Alexander. He tells us of those who've left him for one reason or another. But he also tells us about those in the local church, like Pudens and Linus and Claudia. He, he tells us about those he wants to greet, like Priscilla and Aquila. He tells us about those who stood with him, like Luke, and those he longs to see, like Mark and Timothy. So maybe a bit of a strange ending, you think? It's, it's a bit of a pointless ending, do you think? It's certainly a nightmare ending if you get given the reading, because it's full of those difficult names. Sorry, Gary, but well done, you did really well. But that's where Paul chooses to end his letter, with this slightly strange, we might think, ending. Because in the end, Paul is a people person. Above all, and it can be seen in these verses, he cherishes God's people. And that's a great essential for us to finish with. Because we want to be a church who's cherishing the people of God. Sometimes Paul's presented as so concerned with their doctrine and teaching. He's a bit of an intellectual. He, he, he's so interested in what's uh, said and preached. He might not have time for, for real people. But no, he's a people person. Yes, he does value teaching and doctrine because he knows that it affects people's lives. He knows that it affects people's relationship with God. He knows it affects where they're heading in that earthly race. And here his love for God's people clearly comes through. Comes through at the end of a letter like this. May we too be a church who, yes, is committed to preaching the word, but is committed to preaching the word because we also are cherishing the people of God. Yes, let's preach in season and out of season because we cherish God's people. And that makes sense of that verse that Rachel started us off with today. Because Paul finishes that little section in verse 8 by saying this, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which God the righteous judge will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who've longed for his appearing. That's who he's concerned about. To all who've longed for his appearing. And so Paul finishes the letter. The Lord be with your spirit, he says to Timothy. And then he widens out his, his view, gazes up at the whole church and says, Grace be with you all. Yes, he wants God to be with Timothy so that can, Timothy continues to preach the word. But he wants grace, God's grace for all God's people. Grace be with you all. May we be a church who are concerned to, to preach the word, but want to see that bring grace to all. Grace to all from God, so that we can all say together, as Paul does, to him, to God, be glory forever and ever. Amen. So we come now to our prayers this morning, and Sheila is going to lead us in those. Good morning, everyone, and it's really lovely to be back with you and to pray with you today. The Collect for today. God the Father, help us to hear the call of Christ the King and to follow in his service, whose kingdom has no end, for he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, one glory. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the knowledge of your constant presence, 
We pray, Father, to you, our Creator God, so full of mercy and love. We pray for the worldwide Christian community that unceasing prayer and praise may be offered as our planet turns through day and night, that we may be strengthened and encouraged to reveal Christ to the world. We pray, Father, for your word of truth to be broadcast afresh in such a way that there can be no doubt that it is wholly trustworthy. And help us, Father, to recognise the difference between your truth and those things in the world that are dressed up as truth, but come from a worldly perspective. Let us not be deceived, Lord. Hear us, Father. We trust in you. We pray for all in authority in our world today, that they may be filled with wisdom, that in all areas of discussion, negotiation, policy-making and reform, that your presence be the guiding light and the good of all people be sought. And for the willingness to take the risks it demands, Father, work your love in the world. Hear us, Father, we trust in you. We pray, Father, for the lonely and rejected and the isolated, for those who are suffering because of this pandemic, for the sick and the worried, and for those who grieve, for those whose lives are made almost unbearable by war and oppression, for the refugees and for all who are persecuted and oppressed and for those dear children and families in the world who face terrorism and attack and hunger and a loss of loved ones. Father, give them the knowledge and confirmation of your abiding warmth and love and bless them with the good news of Jesus Christ. Help the aid agencies in their work to relieve suffering and help us to be generous in our giving. Hear us, Father, we trust in you. And we take a time now to remember those known to us who are unwell or suffering in mind, body or spirit. So let's take just a few moments of quietness now so that we can recall and pray for those known to each one of us. So let's pray for them now. And today, Lord, we especially remember to pray for Pauline Cooper. And we pray, Lord, that you minister to her every need. Heal and restore her, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And we do not forget to thank you, Lord, for answered prayer. Thank you, Lord, that you have strengthened me this day to take part in this service after my illness. Amen. So, Heavenly Father, let your healing presence be with all who need you on this Sabbath day. With you beside us, Lord, our journey through this life is so richly blessed with joy and peace. How can we ever thank you for the generosity of your love and your ceaseless care? Father, with these prayers we give our lives into your keeping through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you so much to Sheila for those really wonderful prayers. And as we come to the end of our time together this morning, we want to remember that challenge from 2 Timothy that as a church, as individuals, we want to be committed to preaching the word, preaching the good news, spreading the good news, proclaiming it to others, the good news about the Lord Jesus, that gospel message. And so we've 
A very fitting final hymn. Pam's going to lead us as we sing, We Have a Gospel to Proclaim. Hope you enjoyed uh, singing that wonderful hymn. Thank you for joining us this morning. And just as we finish, we have a final prayer. Because maybe the task of sticking to those essentials, maybe the, the task of proclaiming God's word, the good news, just seems beyond us. And in our own strength it is. So a final prayer from Paul's letter to the Ephesians asking that we would rely and be strengthened by God's power. So now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.